Hello and welcome to the Lacancha Podcast. Today I'm going to take you through the strange weeks we had in Spanish football and we're also going to see what else is going on in Europe. But we're going to start at the Camp Nou where Barca played against Granada. All fair play to Granada. They, they got off this game right off the tracks. They scored early. They defended. But unfortunately for them or fortunately for Barca, depending on how you look at it, Barcelona got a late, late winner thanks to Ronald Araujo, who was the best player in the team and a team that didn't really play all that well it was sort of a continuation from what we saw against Bayern Munich where Barcelona were embarrassing and Bayern they can destroy any team they can they've had wins where they've won 0-3 against Chelsea 7-2 against Spurs 5-1 against Arsenal home and away but in some ways I feel this game was somewhat worse than all the other games I've mentioned and the reason being that Barcelona never really gave anything in that Champions League game. They never really showed belief that they could actually take something from that game or even beat Bayern Munich. It was weird watching it because I believe when you're at home and you're the home team, you have a duty to take the game to the opponent, regardless of how strong the opponent is. And if fine if you want to get a point at least make sure you have the players that can do that because the players on the pitch couldn't do that against Bayern and against Granada which is a much weaker team than Barcelona is they're a team that they haven't got off to the league that well but you have Barcelona who's still struggling to create chances who are putting in over 54 crosses this is the second most crosses they've ever recorded in a game since Opto began recording stats. That's insane. And you know what? Fine, you could say tactically Coleman is inept, and I don't think he's the right man to manage this transition because I don't feel he's a guy who will play in a way that will entertain fans while Barca is going through a transition because I, I believe if Barca playing much better football and they're scoring lots of goals, but let's say they're naive and you're con- also conceding lots of goals. You could say at least they're being entertaining, but this Barca was drab. And part of the reason why I wouldn't put too much blame in Coleman, because we've had this situation where in Barcelona ever since 2016, every single manager has been deemed by Barcelona fans to not be good enough. And they've said that this guy's not good enough. The guy needs to go. And the team keeps on getting worse and worse and worse with every subscriber manager. So maybe it's not the manager's fault because I think this is the worst Barcelona squad since 2002, 2003. Like ever since I've been watching Barcelona, which is 2003, I've not seen a worse squad. Like maybe the 11 might be decent, but the, this is the worst 11 I've seen from Barcelona, to be honest. Performance wise, it might still get better, but in terms of names, there's no one who I think in the squad is a difference maker. Maybe Memphis the Pie can make a difference, but can he make a difference? Can he be the guy who scores 25 plus goals over the course of the season? I don't think so. Then that means that you're relying on Pedro and Asifati who are teenagers and Ansu is just coming off a long-term injury. Pedro has been running to the ground. And you start to think, is this all what Barcelona is about at the moment? The great Barcelona that dominated football. Like, I get it that teams have their time in the sun. But sooner or later, they have to go through some sort of transition. But does it have to be that painful for Barcelona fans? Especially when you look at how Real Madrid has been managed in the last period, right? Where Real Madrid, they've had a similar transition away from Cristiano Ronaldo. And when Cristiano left, they brought in Vinicius, who's having a burning season this so far. But there were also players who were there who could step up. But I look at this Barcelona team and there's no one who's there who's capable of stepping up on a consistent basis. Because can we really trust Sergio Aguero to stay fit for the entire season? Man City couldn't. 
can we really trust us Mane Dembele to stay fit for the entire season? Not really. So can you really blame Koeman for the results? Maybe the performances will be poor, but I think even if you change him, you're still going to get the same results. Definitely won't be as good as Real Madrid, who had a brilliant season in terms of... A brilliant week in terms of results. My bad. They were not so good against Inter and San Siro, but they still got the win. Similar in Mestalla, Valencia dominated this game, but somehow Real Madrid won, and I think... In some ways, I think it was a sucker punch for Valencia because they were so good. They pressed. They weathered adversary, adversity before the game, during the game, before the game, the Los Gaia, the Los Cherishev, who, are, who have been some of the mainstays in the starting lineup since the season began. During the game, Carlos Soler, who has been having a brilliant season, has been on cloud nine. He goes off injured. Thierry Correa goes off injured, and he was handling... Vinicius Jr. pretty well up until that point. And did Valencia feel sorry for them? For sorry for themselves? Did they like were they like, oh, we've lost our best players, like we can't compete? No. They competed against Real Madrid. They looked Real Madrid straight into the face and they created the better chances. At one point they had five occasions and goals compared to Real Madrid one. And when they scored the first goal, it wasn't against the run of play. It was something that he fully deserved. But one thing you have to do when you're playing against big clubs and like very good clubs like Real Madrid is you have to be at it for 90 minutes. And you can't be as conservative as Valencia were in the last 10 minutes after they scored. Because you're inviting the forces of nature to work against you. Because when you're so defensive, you're, you're defending in such a low block. Things can happen in the box that you can't control. And that's what happened when Vinicius scored his first goal. Or in the second goal where Benzema might have used an arm, might have used shoulder. But if you're more progressive as a club, in terms of how you play, those things, you can reduce those things happening. And you know, a fair place to was at Bordelas for the way he set up this team and for the way they played this season because they've been really impressive. They've impressed more than I expected them to do. Now they're in a tough run, so maybe things might be, they might come a little down to earth, but it's a really good performance. But he also made a mistake in the last couple of minutes in in that game. But again, it's something that they can learn from, something that you, you can see a blueprint of what they're trying to do. And eventually they will get better. Eventually they will be able to manage games like this better. But also, fair play to Real Madrid, and especially Eduardo Camavinga, who, when he came on, he did the work of Modric and Casemiro together because both of them had a, they had a stinker, Modric and Casemiro. Casemiro is lucky he didn't get sent off with the rash tackle on Maxi Gomez in the first half. But when Camavinga came on, he did both jobs in for Casemiro's job. He recovered the ball really well. He was always there to distribute. He was always there to progress to play forward. And he put the constant pressure on Valencia. It was very difficult for Valencia to move out of their half because he was there. And he's had a bright week to start his Real Madrid career with. He scored a goal last week. He gave an assist midweek in San Siro where the team were, weren't playing that as, as well. And here in Mestalla, where they haven't won in four or five years, he gives a really good performance. Also, Vinicius Jr., continues his streak he didn't have the best game to, to last yet last night neither did benzema but the one thing with both of them is they're always there and with vinicius especially like what's going to make him a world-class player is he has to be there he has to be there in the key moments in the decisive moments because he has other things in his game he's very difficult to stop he's very skillful he's strong he's powerful he drives into the box really well. He creates spaces because like it's so hard to handle. But one thing he always lacked was his finishing, which he has in full display. Like he has one of the like he's grown so much in that regard. Also in in regards to is it is attacking play, is offensive play, is knowing what to do in the final third of the pitch. He's blossomed really well in that this season, and he could be one of he is possibly going to be one of the faces of La Liga in the years to come if he continues this level. And that's 
what made the difference in a game where they weren't playing well and having players like him, players like Benzema, who are difference makers. And that's what allowed Real Madrid to win. And speaking of players who are difference makers, and a player I want to touch on is Aiden Hazard. He hasn't had the best of the best of times at Real Madrid. And it doesn't seem like he's going to get any better because with a form of Vinicius, with Rodrigo growing into his Real Madrid career, Hazard would have a difficult time coming into this team because as as he left the pitch, the team got better. And this is a guy who came into this league with big reputation, with lots of expectations. Everyone and their mother said that he is going to be the guy to really like take Real Madrid to the next level. And he hasn't done that. He's had injury problems. He's been overweight when he's come for training. Like, it doesn't seem like he's, with the way he's going, he's going to have a great career at a club that he really loves and he needs to change something. And hopefully this thing with Vinicius makes him realize that my place is in danger. I need to play better. And, but you know what? Real Madrid, even though that he isn't playing well, Things are really going well for them in attack. They have, like, their stuff sorted in that area. But Atletico Madrid, they really don't. They were very poor in in the game against Atletic. They were very poor in the first half. I thought they gave it away. Offensively, I don't really know what Simeone is doing right now or what his best offensive lineup. He makes too many changes. And when the players come in, they're not very good in terms of, like, his substitutions. Today, with a starting lineup, Griezmann and Correa, they didn't really get a chance to like play together and to develop. And I felt he should have waited a bit longer to take them off. Because when Luis Suarez came in, he didn't have the impact that it's expected. And Suarez hasn't been good for the past year, to be honest. I think he scored four goals since since February or since, since January in La Liga. And the problem is partly has to do with Simeone's tactics because to get the best out of Suarez either you need to play closer to the box because Suarez is not the kind of player who can make those runs and I feel because he's playing so far maybe maybe not as not as far back as before but he's not playing as close to the box and it's like Atleti are just one trick pony where they try that Trippier, Koke, Llorente triangle, and when it works, it's brilliant. But teams have figured that out. And maybe they were missing a bit of Lamar magic because he has been brilliant and he's the one player who makes a difference, who can do something else, who can be as creative. And maybe sub enough Yannick Ferreira Carrasco wasn't the best of decisions, but hindsight is twenty twenty. They need something. They need something different. And Rodrigo de Paul at the moment, for all the hype, he's not really producing. But that's not to take away things from Athletic, who were very solid in defense. But for Atleti, it's 11 points out of 15, which is not bad. They're two points off Real Madrid. And they will take solace about the fact that Sevilla, Barcelona, Real Sociedad, Villarreal, they aren't playing that well at the moment as well. Like, Sevilla, Real Sociedad, I felt both teams really disappointed in that game. Because both teams have the quality to make an exciting game, as we saw last season, where I believe over the course of both games, like, they scored about eight goals in total. And this goal, this game finished nil-nil. And part of that was Real Sociedad not having the forcefulness to take advantage of Sevilla who couldn't handle pressure in this game and they couldn't have, they also couldn't handle pressure against Salzburg. Salzburg were brilliant and they should have won that game because Sevilla gave away pointless penalties. In fact that's become an issue for them. Four penalties given away in two games. That's mid table level defending and they're meant to have one of the best defensives in La Liga and that's unacceptable the mistakes they're making at the moment. Diego Carlos, I will defend him a bit because I think he's a very good defender. He makes a lot of good blocks. He is very commanding in the air. But the sort of mistakes he's making 
or why the bigger teams aren't coming for him, but they're going for Jules Kunde. Because Kunde doesn't make those sort of mistakes, those mistakes that could cost your team a title like he did, like he almost did in the Europa League, or cost your team a game. And he needs to improve in that area. And Lopetegui needs to improve in how his team handles that sort of pressure. Because to be successful, if they, there's a small chance they can win the league. And if they can, they need to be able to play out of those pressure situations. And in the Champions League, they're still, I think they're still favorites to win their group and to advance. And they should advance. But in the latter stages, in you against top European teams, they played us that sort of pressure and Sevilla need to get better because like that's what happened against Borussia Dortmund in that in that when they played them last season, Dortmund capitalized because they have a striker as great as Erling Holland, the great Erling Holland, against defensive mistakes and failure to handle that pressure. And that's something Sevilla needs to get better about in their next level of development. But so far, like I think there's still much room for improvement with them and with Real Sociedad and also with Villarreal, who love drawing. They, they, they might set the Guinness record for draws in Spain because the record right now is 18 and they're, four, <laughs> they're, 14, they're 14 draws away from 10, that record. And fair play to Mallorca, it was a good point for them. They've really started well the season. And it doesn't look like they would have any relegation troubles. Also, Raya Vallecano thrashing Hetafe. The main attraction of this game was the return of El Tigre Radamel Falca. I woke up early to watch this game because I love watching Rayo. I think they're one of the best teams to watch in Spain this year. They play brilliant football. They're very offensive. They're better defensively than what people who might remember from Rai Vallecano from a team that gets like smashed like 6-2, 10-2 but still entertained. This time with Iraola, they have a much solid defense, but they have they attack, they play to entertain, and I really love how they play. I really love the fact that Radamel Falcao got a goal on his debut. It's nice to see him back in Spain. It's nice to see like the old band getting together, Falcao, Negredo and Soldado. We just need Fernando Llorente and the band's complete. <laughs> but yeah, like Atafe, they they are having a terrible start. Five games, five losses. Michel's in trouble. I gave him a bit of credit in the first three games because although Sevilla and Barca haven't started well, they're still good teams and they should still beat Atafe on their day. And I don't expect Atafe to get anything from those games but against Elche against Rayo even though Rayo have been playing brilliant football at top you have the better players and I don't think Michel's a very good coach and I, I think the sooner they get rid of him the better because a lot of the recent recently promoted teams like Rayo and Mallorca they've been they've been doing well in the opening stages and Hatafe are might find themselves in a relegation battle like he left Malaga in. And you have to get rid of him sooner rather than later because this team has the quality to stay in the in this division. I don't think they're as hopeless as Alaves, who we'll get onto later. But with the former newly promoted teams, they need to make quick improvements or they're going to struggle. And now moving on to one of those newly promoted teams, Espanyol, who got an unlikely point against Betis. Betis... They've been improving. They've been playing brilliant football over the past week. They were brilliant in their win against Granada. They were brilliant in their comeback against Celtic. They were brilliant today, and they should have won this game by two or three goals. But they feel take advantage of their chances. And they make a silly defensive error. It was a pointless challenge, and it was a well-deserved red card because the challenge really was daft. And after that, you could see the walls closing in. Espanyol, who were complaining about 10 minutes added on, they, they got 8 minutes added on in this game, and they fully took advantage of it. They got a point, and I think it's undeserved. I don't think Espanyol have been playing really well. In the second half, Betis, like, they sh it should have been a thrashing. But they get away with it. They have Alaves to play, who are terrible at the moment, so... Maybe that's where to get the first win of the season. Seven teams are yet to win 
in La Liga this season. And one of them is Celta Vigo, who had the unfortunate circumstance of playing Cadiz, and a Cadiz who gave the most Cadiz performance. With only 87 passes, they won a game of football. 87 passes. My Coet team could make 87 passes, complete passes, in less time in a smaller pitch. <laughs> but a professional team winning a game with 87 passes is just catch things. And this is one of the thing, one of the reasons why uh, I said last season it was statistically unlikely for them to stay up. And I think this season is statistically unlikely for them to stay up. But they will still stay up because I don't get how you can have that little possession, that little passes, so many errant passes, and still win football games. But Salto Vigo, their offense isn't there yet. And in the second half, things improved. I really hope El Chacho can get things going because I really like the way he's he plays football, his teams play football. But one point out of 15 is not good reading. But the good thing for him is that Salter are very patient and I'll say the same with Atafi like both teams are very patient so they'll give him a lot of rope I remember when Toto Berito went through some similar to Salter he only he didn't win in 10 games and the board were very patient and that turned out great for them because he took them to Europa League semi-final and with Caldet I'm not saying he would take them to a Europa League semi-final but I believe he deserves the same level of patience because Salta, they've run, they've burned through too many managers. And for once, they need to show faith and patience in that one manager. And that might be something that will help them. And that's something that their next opponents have shown in Levante. And I think Salta will beat them midweek because of the problems they've been having. But Levante have shown faith in Paco Lopez. And Paco is someone who I really like a lot. He's someone who's very brave. His teams play very well against the top teams. And his teams are very exciting to watch. And this weekend, they were the better team against Elche. But they didn't take advantage of their chances, and which a lot of teams in Spain don't do. And when you don't take advantage of your chances, you always lose points. And unfortunately for them, they've lost El Comandante Morales, who's one of their best players. They've lost... Campania, the best midfielder, in my opinion. They lost Bardi, one of the best players, De Frutos. They've also lost Malsa. And they're losing a lot of these key players. And they have Sal they have Salta and Barcelona to come, which is why it might be a difficult week for them. But I I think they're going to keep the faith in Paco. And eventually, they will slowly but surely move up the table. But Levante is a funny team because they rely on results against the big teams to stay up. <laughs> this season, maybe they might not get those results, but hopefully they stay up and they continue to entertain us. Unlike Alaves, who have been awful, 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 awful. They are not the level of the Premier, in my opinion, so far. But you know what? Sometimes Alaves, they have these starts. I think once they went six games without winning... And eventually they somehow stayed up. But this season might be one too too much for them. Osuna, like they came off their four one thrashing to Valencia and they comfortably won this game. And it's warring signs for them. I don't think they might be able to stay up at this point, but hopefully they do. Like hopefully they something happens in their middle game against Espanol and when they welcome Atletico next week, but I don't see them getting points from either game, to be honest. And this might be curtains for Calleja, who I liked at Villarreal. I liked him when he came back, but it's not been so good for them since um, since the return to Premier Football. And that's it for La Liga for this week. And now we're going to take our tour around Europe, starting in, in Italia, where Juve Milan was one of the high-profile games on Sunday, as long, along with... PSG versus Lyon and Valencia versus Real Madrid, of course. Also Chelsea versus Spurs, but that was earlier in the earlier in the day. But with Juve, they're still in the relegation zone. Two points from twelve from twelve possible. And is this the point we start to worry about Juventus? Are they gonna get relegated? Are they gonna go back to Serie B? No. I think I think they still have a future in Serie A. Maybe you might even challenge for top four i'm not too sure about the scudetto this week 
I know I know last week I said that they could possibly still win it, but ten points between them and the top it's a lot and nine points between them and Inter it's a lot. You're relying on Inter Napoli not having great seasons or having real stinkers and Juve picking up those points and it's very difficult. It is possible because it is, it is Juventus and they have a strong goal over Serie A, but it's I would I would say that it's a pro it's a project in its transition and you need to give it time because losing Cristiano Ronaldo, like with Barcelona losing Messi, it's it's difficult to overcome that. And you do need to give this team time. There will be easier fixtures. But yeah, like that's how things are for Juve and compared to their big rivals Inter, Inter they smash Bologna six one. And they they looked good against Real Madrid. They were the better team against Real Madrid. I thought they should have won that game. But Thibaut Courtois came up really well. The problem for Inter that I, I assume it will, might be in Europe, which I think they really should perform well in this group because it's not really a strong group. Shakhtar, they don't look as good as they did last season. They lost to Sheriff. Alcaraz Sheriff, first game in the Champions League ever, first win. But Inter should should qualify. They've gone through so many seasons where they've been in Champions League. They've been in strong positions, but they still didn't qualify. And hopefully they, that changes this season. I think that should be the aim. Because in Serie A, I think they're, they're in a strong position to retain their title. Given how poorly Juve have started. Given how... Like, Napoli have started well. Milan and Roma as well. But I think in terms of the squad, they have the strongest. Maybe Napoli might be the second but I do see them winning this league especially given the form Juve has started with but in the Champions League that's where the questions will be asked and they need show improvements and I hope they do because I really like Inter and hopefully they can they can do both they can win the Scudetto and go as far as possible in the Champions League and speaking of top flyers Napoli 4-0 my man Victor Osman the Nigerian king Scoring three goals this week. Since three goals this week and two in the Europa League, one in the 4 0 fashion of Udinese. And that's something that you would expect them to do. Like, you would expect the form that they're showing, given the players that they've had. They were in the six fancy under Gattuso. So it's good to see a Napoli team that's scoring goals, that's thrashing teams. And hopefully they can keep this up and they can give Inter a good run for their money and hopefully finish in top four because it's always nice to have Napoli in the Champions League given the fact that they've been really good so far in Serie A and you want to see those good teams continue to maintain that level. A team that's trying to get up to that level is Roma. They got a pumpkin this weekend and a pumpkin is like a shock. And they lost to the famous giant killers in Serie A, which is Hellas Verona. And Verona, they're one of those teams that when the big teams come, they come in life where it's similar to like Levante <laughs> in La Liga where they, they save their best performances for those big occasions. They were, they were the team that caused Napoli not to qualify for the Champions League last season at the, at the expense of Juve. And they showed why and they showed that they're still going to be that sort of team this season. Beating Roma 3-2 and getting surviving that battle in Roma's league charge. So, like, hopefully they can stay mid-table. Mid -table. For Roma, it's a loss, but I, like I said, Verona do this to, to all big Serie A teams. So maybe, like, with Sampdoria with Inter last, se last week, I wouldn't maybe read too much into that. And I still think Jose Mourinho still has done a good job so far. But it's still early days into the season. With all these different leagues, you can't really read too, too much. And you have to wait until like 10 or 12 games to get a read of like who's actually really good, who's actually doing well, who's actually doing poorly and having a scorecard for that. And now let's move over to England. Another of the top games that took place earlier that day was Chelsea versus Spurs. Chelsea winning 3-0, comfortably continuing the strong form. Cristiano scoring versus West Ham. United surviving a late scare at the end there with De Gea showing his true form with a penalty save. Liverpool also winning, but City dropping points to Southampton. Pep got into hot water when he said that his fans should come for that game. I think 
in this case, I think Pep is in the wrong. Although it is ironic that fans are a bit pissed off that the manager is telling them how to support a team while they tell the manager which tactics to use, which 11 to pick. But given what's happening with COVID, with what's happening with the economic situation of like so many different clubs, I think he should be more respectful to his fans. But in terms of how City are, they were really impressive against Leipzig, fashion them 6-3. It, it is a poor point to drop, to be honest. So, and especially when your rivals are starting so well. But again, opening point of the season, we have to wait a bit longer before we can see more data and before we can see whether to worry about them or whether not to worry about them. And going to Germany, where Erling Haaland scored an amazing goal against Union Berlin. Good finish. I'm not sure whether it was the goalkeeper's fault or whether it was Haaland, but since Haaland is the great Haaland, I think maybe that was more <laughs> due to him than the goalkeeper. And in the Haaland Mbappe debate, which might change world football as we transition from Cristiano and Messi I'm on team Holland I think he's a much better player than Mbappe to be honest because Mbappe has like certain limitations especially when he's going against a team that's low block in Holland he can do he's fast he's strong he's good in the air but that's a that's a question for another day that's my uh, my personal preference Leipzig continued to struggle they conceded 11 goals in their last three games. 4-1 thrashing to Bayern, 6-3 thrashing against City, 1-1 draw to Cologne. It's not been the greatest weeks for Jesse Marsh, but he needs time. He needs time because it is a transition. They've lost their manager from last season, Nagelsmann, who is now killing it at Bayern. They lost Upamecano, Konate, Sabitzer. It's going to take a while for them to grow back into the team that they were couple of seasons ago where the threatened to challenge Bayern and Dortmund but and we have to give Jesse Marsh some time and it's always good to see a North American guy thrive in Europe like Alphonse Davies is doing in Bayern Munich and yeah like I'll just say give him time like these these sort of things do happen and he needs patience unfortunately for Wolfsburg I think I cursed him because I sang the praises last week and now they've lost their 100% status in the Bundesliga drawing at home to Eintracht Frankfurt which gave Bayern Munich the opportunity to regain their t- supremacy in the Bundesliga yay for Bayern yay like and now it, we're gonna see how long can they hold it like will they win the 10th Bundesliga title most likely they will most likely but like let's let's pretend like there's gonna be a title race and we're gonna say Wolfsburg are level on points of Bayern. They can also still win it. Dortmund are a point away. They can also still win it. So let's not kill the Bundesliga title race yet. But knowing Bayern Munich, seeing how strong they were, especially against Barcelona, where they were amazing, against Bochum, they, they smashed them for seven. Um, it's difficult to see any team challenging them, to be honest. And in another league where they, there's a super-sized team in France, ah, PSG. And it's been a decent week for them. Not so much in the Champions League. They went to Brussels and they got a pumpkin at Brugge. And Brugge, they're one of those teams with good atmospheres. And if a big team's not at it, like you, you could drop points. And it's like one of those teams like Young Boys where United went there and they weren't at it and they dropped points to Young Boys. They lost to Young Boys, similar to when Juventus went there. So it's like a lot of these... like teams outside the top five top six leagues in Europe like we don't really give them as much credit as they should like also a team like Salzburg or even Red Star Belgrade and I think uh, yeah it was Slavia Prague they were another team that gave a lot of big boys trouble because like when you do go to those places they're used to winning so they have that winning mentality and that's possibly what happened with Paris Saint-Germain the weekend comes they have Olympique Lyonnais one of the big clashes in France and Lyon started really well I was very happy when Paqueta scored <laughs> and I thought maybe maybe just maybe they could sneak a win or a point because Lyon's my French team but they didn't and PSG as usual in the Parc de France came 
came back and they won T1. <laughs> and the big talking point was Leo Messi, who got subbed off while PSG were drawing. There it seemed like to be like a big, like not really a big, but like a argument or facialization between Messi and Pochettino. And now the, all the controversy is Messi, is transitioning to a different league, is can only do it in Barcelona, yada, yada, yada. Give him time. He's barely played more than three games in in PSG. He needs time to settle his teammates. And when Cristiano moved to Juventus, the same old rubbish was said about him that he's going to struggle. And like, lo and behold, he, he came, came out of that. He scored lots of goals. He was very pivotal for Juventus and Champions League, especially in knockout stages because he wasn't really there in the group stages. But... Same thing, you have to give Messi a bit of time. You have to give him a bit of time with his new teammates to settle in France. It's his first time out of Barcelona in like 17, 18 years. So let's cut this guy some slack. I know there are haters out there who really want to kill him, but you need to give this guy time to really show. And again, like with Leipzig, like with Juventus, it's going to take some time, but I'm sure eventually he will because from in my opinion, he's possibly the greatest player that I've ever seen. I think he's the greatest player that I've ever seen. And he was great for Barcelona last season, so I don't see why he won't be great for Paris this season. And from there, we go to Portugal, where Los Tres Grandes all won this weekend. Benfica still lead the way. A moment of silence for Sporting, because Sporting got their ass whooped against Ajax. <laughs> it was a terrible ass whooping, especially at home. It's like 1-5. And... Um, Massive respect to Porto. Out of the Portuguese teams, they had the best results. Getting a 0 0 draw against Atletico was brilliant. I thought they defended well. They were very good in their pressure. Um, but they're four points off the top for Benfica. Benfica have got a flying in, in Liga Nosh. And maybe this might be the year they win it back because it's been Porto and Sporting in the last two years. And let's see what happens. And that's all I have for this week. I'm Taj, and this is Lakantra Podcast, and hopefully I'll be speaking to you all next week. Have a wonderful week.